Welcome, everyone. My name is Samir Kakodkar. I'm a gastroenterologist and specialist in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Welcome to Against the Grain. Please do check out the rest of my podcasts, which can be found at the website S-A-M-I-R, the number three, dot podomatic, dot com. It can also be found on YouTube or Spotify by searching my first and last name. For those who are interested in contacting me regarding questions or for virtual appointments, my email is S-A-M-I-R, the number three, at gmail.com. Please join the private Facebook group called Against the Grain for ongoing discussions about these podcasts. This podcast is not meant to be medical advice or a substitute for medical care. This is a discussion to encourage further research into this topic. All right. We've got Asad Munez, Dr. Asad Munez, on the podcast today. Asad is a third-year fellow at our a GI fellow at, our, at Lutheran General Hospital, almost finishing, soon to be in attending. So, Asad, how's it going? Hey, Samir, how are you? Thanks for having me on the podcast. Hey, good. Have you ever been on a podcast before? Never. Okay. So this is my this first is time. First time. Um, so, I'm sure, you know, you, you did this presentation at our GI Grand Rounds on fistulizing Crohn's disease. And it was, uh, a, you know, a great overview. So I thought it would be a good idea to have you on to talk about what you looked up and all the kind of the new, new research. Uh, and, you know, the, the audience for this podcast will be both medical professionals as well as patients who are struggling with this condition. So uh, I think, Asad, your presentation is pretty high level as far as terminology and uh, more meant for a medical audience, but I'll try to chime in and if thing, if I feel like things are a little bit uh, hard to understand from a patient's perspective, I'll try to, you know, reword it uh, so that they understand too. Yeah, sounds good. Um, and it's an honor to be on this. I'm excited. Uh, hopefully it'll be a good talk and I'll try to go through things slowly. I know I can talk fast, so just, you know, tell me to hit the brakes whenever. Okay. And yeah, look, look forward to it. All right, cool. All right, let's start. All right. So as a disclaimer, you know, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures, any conflict of interest to report. Um, Pretty much, you know, I just kind of want to go through kind of the natural history and the approach to fistulizing disease 101 uh, in in kind of in a nutshell here. Um, So, you know, fistulizing disease can affect up to about, you know, 40 percent of patients with Crohn's disease. Um, And a lot of the you know epidemiology statistics and numbers that we have on fistulizing disease, whether it's internal and penetrating or per- perianal fistulizing disease, is pretty difficult because a lot of patients may have luminal disease, may or may not develop perianal disease, or perianal disease may be the presenting symptom. Um, sometimes it's actually the most common and can be the first manifestation of Crohn's disease as well, too. Um, in general, though, like almost 25% of people may develop pararectal complications, fistula formations, pararectal abscesses, um, and it typically ends up being a stronger association with um, Crohn's colitis, luminal disease in the colon, more so than small bowel disease in the Crohn's. So um, let, let's just go over the basics. Um, so we see fistulas in Crohn's, but not in ulcerative colitis, Right. And right. you mentioned this entity of, you know, sometimes perianal disease can be the first presentation, perianal fistulas. Um, but before we go into that, can you just go over, like, what is a fistula for those patients out there who may not have it or are, are just curious as far as what it is if they haven't heard that terminology? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And actually, to even answer that, I wouldn't mind kind of going a little bit even more kind of behind the scenes of how, you know, fistulas even develop. So we kind of know in general, inflammatory bowel disease, right, there's this inflammatory component behind it. Um, with fistulizing disease, it's relatively similar, right? There's, there's this huge, robust inflammatory response, inflammatory infiltrates at the site of these fistulas. Um, it's pretty much a T-cell mediated response. There's some macrophages, neutrophils, things like that, um, but pretty much you just have a lot of T cells, different types of them, and different types of CD cells there that are playing a role. These inflammatory cells are producing TNF. You have fibroblasts producing transgromane, 
transforming growth factors and interleukins. And essentially, this does this, what we, what we now know as an epithelial to mesenchymal transition or this tissue remodeling at a certain tissue level. And essentially, once you start having that phenomenon, a lot of the quote unquote, like the, the barriers or the cell membranes all start to become a bit more deformed. Um, these epithelial cells down regulate certain proteins, the cell membranes, things like that. They lose their integrity. And essentially, you start having this infiltration of these inflammatory cells. And there's another concept that if these inflamed, that portion of the inflamed intestine can make these uh, certain uh, enzymes or proteins called matrix metalloproteinases. These degrade that extracellular matrix that I was referring to and kind of degrade those components. And there's a different types of these uh, MMPs, what we abbreviate them as, and they found that these MMPs are highly expressed around those fistulizing sites. Now, this is like the proposed pathogenesis of where we think uh, is happening at these fissilizing sites. So this mucosal ulceration, this transmural inflammation that kind of defines a Crohn's disease, maybe even luminal bacteria, they all kind of play a key role in the onset of a fistula and their perpetuation of these fistulas as well, too. Now, when you have this inflammation at this site, the key point, the key part of all of this is that the inflammation happens to such an extent that it can penetrate through the layers of the tissue and eventually leading or creating this tunnel to another end. Once you have that tunnel, that's where you have this fistula. If you don't really have that tunnel, meaning you can't go from point A to point B, is what we call a sinus tract. But once you penetrate that last layer, what we call the serosa, that's where it results in that fistula. Okay, so... Um, just to summarize what you said, um, more of like a bird's eye view of <laughs> what you said, but that's like the the very technical medical terminology for what's going on. But basically, it's a tracking of this inflammation with Crohn's. We know Crohn's involves inflammation and inflammation of all layers of the bowel. And sometimes that penetrates through the bowel from, loop, from one loop of bowel or colon to another organ or even to the skin and that's basically what it is it usually starts with some infection or inflammation uh involving uh, especially in the perianal region an anal crypt uh, or these kind of like uh you know the the epithelial cells are the lining of of the colon or small bowel and they form these crypts or almost like these uh how do i describe this it's kind of like a divot or uh, a little dimple, I guess. dimple downwards, and it's lined by these epithelial cells, and there's like inflammation there, and uh, there because of the faulty healing that's involved with having Crohn's, that process um, ends up tracking through the wall, um, and then it goes along a path of least resistance, and with perianal disease, which is what we probably see most commonly. Um, you know, can end up with the fistula on the outside in the perianal area around the rectum or even involving the rectum itself. Right, right. And I think, you know, the kind of the gist of it is, is if there's uncontrolled inflammation going on here and nothing is really done about it, then eventually you're going to create that tunnel. You'll have point A to point B, like you mentioned, and you end up getting that fistulous tract. Right. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and then depending on, you know, where these fistulas are, um, it's pretty much how we, not even just as medical doctors, but even surgeons would want to know because treatment at some point um, is going to be based off where these fistulas are. And so, you know, you can kind of characterize these as perianal fistulas, which kind of perianal pretty much tells you where they are, or non-perianal fistulas. So non-perianal fistulas are mainly in the abdomen, we refer to them as like internal penetrating disease and then perianal fistulas obviously are in the perianal region and so these external fistulas so these are the perianal ones these are the more common ones they probably represent up to you know 55 percent of the type of fistulas that we see in, in Crohn's patients um, one third of these fistulas you know are pr pretty much internal and the rest are all pretty much external and when you have these external fistulas, it's pretty much just a roadmap based off the anatomy and really where they are. And so, you know, we can kind of go into some of the details about this as well, too. Mainly this kind of 
boils down to the physician doing their examination and we'll kind of get into how you really capture these as well too but typically to kind of find a fistulizing disease it's pretty much based off your history and physical patients will kind of come in and tell you hey doc you know i'm having some discomfort down there or i'm noticing some some drainage down there and once you get you know you can do some imaging or do an exam you can really classify these and so pretty much we classify these based off where they really are right so are they kind of affecting the internal and external anus sphincters the muscles around there or are they not so a superficial fistula is one kind and that actually doesn't even cross or traverse any of the sphincters or musculatures. These are pretty um, kind of, you know, straightforward, superficial uh, fistulas in the perineal region. And then after that, it gets a little bit more progressive, a little bit more complex, um, and, and it kind of correlates with the patient's symptoms too. The second one is the most common one, which is what we refer to as an intersphincteric. So this fistula tract um, kind of traverses between the internal and the external anal sphincter, and it goes through this intersphincteric plane. It spares the external anal sphincter. Some of those details are more so for, you know, the surgeons when they do their surgical planning, if medical management isn't, you know, failing, things like that. But typically, uh, you know, these are a little more nuances that are important for the surgeons if, when they're getting down in there. Um, but again, it all helps kind of characterize and classify these Another kind is a transphenteric fistula. So this does go through the external anal sphincter. So that's different from the intersphenteric, which doesn't, which spares the external anal sphincter. The transphenteric does uh, traverse through the external anal sphincter. And depending on where this starts and where this ends, right, point A to point B, depending on what we call in the anatomy our dentate line, if it's above or it's below, you can kind of categorize this fistula as it's simple or as a complex. Again, a little bit more nuance there. And then there's a couple others after that too, suprasphenteric and then extrasphenteric. These are pretty comp these are categorized complex. They go through more of the different tissue planes. They may go through some of the muscles, um, and you know they can uh, kind of result in a bit more symptomatic disease too with abscesses and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there, there's different ways of classifying these perianal fistulas, and obviously there's classification systems out there as well. Some more the surgeons kind of use, some more as gastroenterologists use. Um, I think as, as GI folks, we try to keep things simple um, in terms of terminology, and so these fistulas, we kind of say, are they simple or are they complex, right? So the simple ones, there's maybe a single opening. Um, they're not traversing through any other organs like the rectum or the vet vagina. You know, these are below the dentate line, nothing crazy going on. And then you got the complex fistula. So these are, you know, more symptomatic ones. There are multiple openings. There are, patients may have a lot of pain, fluctuation, discomfort there, a lot of drainage. Um, they could be rectovaginal fistulas. There could be anal rectal strictures, things like that. So we end up classifying it through our AGA guidelines as simple and complex, pretty much based off of where they're opening and where they're ending in that perianal region. So yeah, I do use that, uh, you know, simple, simple and complex uh, classification. Uh, but I, and and that is very helpful because yeah, a lot of these classification schemes, yeah, are more towards the colorectal surgery domain. Uh, but that's helpful. And I, and I also like to classify it as, as you mentioned, like internal and external. The internal fistulas are the ones that extend from one loop. Uh, of diseased bowel and terminate in an adjacent loop of bowel or another organ. And those are the ones like uh, the enteroenteric fistulas, like one p one portion of bowel to another. Um, a common one would be like an ileosigmoid uh, fistula. And then enterovesicular, which is bowel to bladder, rectovaginal, rectum to vagina. And that, so those are the internal fistulas, and then the how I conceptualize external fistulas are ones that go from diseased bowel to skin, and so that could be either enterocutaneous, uh, meaning bowel to to like the abdominal wall or to the skin, and then also what we talked about the perianal fistulas and even peristomal fistulas. Uh, so uh, that's a helpful classification, and also helps to you know, classify how the treatments work for these different types of fistulas. Um, another thing to keep in mind for the patients out there listening is that not all fish, perianal fistulas are from Crohn's disease. Um, there's a whole different kind that tend to be more simple, simple fistulas that are called cryptoglandular, which can happen in the absence of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, 
Um, so just because you have a fistula doesn't mean you have Crohn's. So usually if we see fistulas, we look for it and see if you have inflammation in the bowel to support that diagnosis, but it's not always the case. And also these fistulas, like for example, interocutaneous fistulas, bowel to abdominal wall, sometimes can happen like right after surgery and don't necessarily mean it's due to active Crohn's and it could just be related to leaking from where bowel is connected or some surgical issue. Uh, so it's not all of these mean Crohn's is the problem. Right, right. And yeah, I mean, uh, definitely these internal or these non perianal fistulas, um, you know, what you refer to, sometimes these can be also kind of hard to catch and diagnose. And, you know, it kind of goes back to that initial pathogenesis of, you know, these sinus tracts, if they don't end up terminating on some other, you know, epithelial surface, then they pretty much just kind of sealed themselves off, almost like a sealed off perforation, or you know they develop into the, like these inflammatory masses. They can get infected. You can get an infection, um, and sometimes you can see those. You know, sometimes post-surgically as well too, or just in general. But again, really, these internal ones until they kind of go from point A to point B, um, they remain a sinus tract. But once you get to that point B, which like you referred to another loop of small bowel or the colon or the bladder or what have you, you know, that's where you end up getting those internal fistulas too. Right. All right, keep going. What's next? Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, fistula 101 there. And I mean, again, kind of knowing, you know, how often this has happened, it's really hard, you know, to kind of say because the incidence of perianal or even non perianal is pretty much based off of, you know, referral based studies than they are based off population based studies, right? So you can count up all the number of patients you have, let's say with Crohn's, um, and your number of patients may be pretty low. But if you go speak to a colorectal surgeon, they may tell you a, a complete opposite number, and that's because of their referral base. And so um, it's difficult to really, you know, capture how many folks are actually out there suffering from this disease, but I mean, obviously up to a quarter to 40% of Crohn's patients could. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the disease is, is out there. Uh, the studies are a little bit limited and treatment ends up becoming quite difficult, sometimes even refractory. Um, recurrences are quite frequent. And I mean, you know, it's pretty obvious, but unfortunately it's a pretty significant burden on these patients too. It can impact, you know, their health, their quality of life, um, and makes, makes, treating them uh, quite challenging. Yeah, I mean, when when you see a patient, um, Assad, in, in clinic or in the hospital, and they have fistulas, really of any kind, with Crohn's disease, I mean, what what are you thinking as far as is the you know what what first comes to mind for me is you know this is this is game time you know we have to get this we have to treat this aggressively uh, because this really is the most challenging form of Crohn's disease to treat um, realistically oftentimes we're not completely successful uh, unfortunately most of the time so uh, we have a we need to you know hit it hard from the beginning. Otherwise, if you, you know, waste time with patients just on steroids or uh, not definitive, the best definitive therapy that we have, then you risk not being able to control this at all, and it can get out of hand. Right. No, I agree. I mean, if when we see these patients and they're having and they're suffering from this fistulizing disease, you know, the same bells go off in my mind. Like, it's game time. There's uncontrolled inflammation, and we need to get on top of it, and we need to get on top of it ASAP. Um, you know, and we're going to go into some of the, you know, medical management and some of the studies kind of, you know, throughout the past couple of decades of what we have to support and not support some of these. Uh, but the, but yeah, the bottom line is we need to get them on therapy. We need to get them on therapy real fast to help kind of control the disease. Cause there's, you know, there's, you know, there's obviously nothing wrong with, you know, um, diversion and surgeries, obviously a topic of discussion for later, and there's nothing wrong with any of that. But if we can try to avoid that with some of the medications that we have now, especially in today's day and age, um, I think we'd be doing a patient, you know, a, a benefit in getting them on that therapy plan ASAP. Right. And, and this, this, uh, interview is or in podcast is really focused on medical management you know both of us aren't surgeons so the you know the technical issues and uh about actually doing surgery for these types of patients where we don't have the expertise of for uh but we definitely can talk about the medical therapy and and briefly we'll touch on some of the surgical techniques probably later on 
Yeah, for sure. And so, yeah, I mean, once, you know, we kind of know the behind the scenes of these fictionalizing disease. We kind of know where they are. Uh, there's been several studies done in kind of, you know, really diagnosing these objectively. And so, you know, but like it's a little old now, almost like 20 years old now, but there was a prospective triple blinded study done that looked at the accuracy of rectal endoscopic ultrasounds, pelvic MRIs, even surgical exam under anesthesia. And, you know, when you combine any of these two tests, the accuracy is up to like 100 percent. And so once your history and physical pretest probability is quite high, any one of these exams will help really diagnose exactly where that fistula is and where it's coming from. And again, it's more of a prognosis and telling us, hey, how successful will we probably be with medical therapy or do we need to have a surgeon on board right away, which again, like you alluded to, we'll touch upon a little bit, but not too much. Um, and so, you know, any one of these three combination of these tests, uh, most of the time MRI and ends up ending up being an exam under anesthesia, but obviously an ultrasound, endoscopic ultrasound could also be performed. You combine any one of these two and your accuracy of diagnosing these is up to 100%. Um, imaging of non-perianal penetrating disease, that can be a little bit more tricky and difficult um, to catch. Again, some of these patients may be just asymptomatic. Some of these patients may not have a fistula yet and they could be a sinus tract. But once you have the fistulizing uh, or the fistula formed internally, then you know a CT enterography is actually a, a fairly good sensitive test, up to about 81%. Um, some of this data is coming out of the Journal of Inflammatory Bowel Disease in 2018, where they uh, compared transabdominal ultrasound, they looked at CT enterography, they looked at MR enterography, and you know there's some of the concept with the CT and MR enterography being that high contrast load in the small bowels really help lighting up the intestines to see you know where where that fistula is and where it's terminating. And so if you're looking for that fistula, uh, an initial test could be a CT enterography. I think transabdominal ultrasound has a role in a place, uh, mainly abroad for right now, but I think there's a lot of academic centers here in the U.S. that are looking more into it, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the next 5, 10 years we have better data out there to support transabdominal ultrasound as the initial step, especially in some of our younger folks who we may be trying to avoid radiation in. So uh, just a couple of follow-up points. The, so Asad, if you if you were able, were seeing a, like a new Crohn's patient in clinic that, uh, and you do the perianal exam and see some signs of possible fistulizing disease, given what you just said about diagnosis, what would really be the next step? Is it getting an MRI, or is it sending it to the colorectal surgeon so that they can you know do an exam under anesthesia, check everything out? address any sepsis, put cetons in, um, like what is the first step for you? Because usually what I do is if I am suspicious for, for fistulizing disease, um, I, I obviously you're thinking down the line I'm going to have to start this patient on medical therapy and you need to address any kind of abscess or an infectious process beforehand before putting them on medical therapy. So I usually just send them to colorectal surgery. Oftentimes, they get an exam under anesthesia. And if, if after that exam under anesthesia, the surgeon still thinks they need more testing done, then they usually order the MR pelvis. Uh, that's what I've seen in my practice, but it, there's wide variability. Um, but I think if the pretest probability is low, meaning you're not sure if there is an official at all, um, but maybe based on complaints, maybe you see a little bit of fluctuance uh, in the in the perianal area, and you're not sure. That's when I would get an MRI. But if I'm like reasonably sure there's already a fistula there, I'll just send them to colorectal surgery. Right, right. And I think, like you mentioned, there's there's a lot of variability in how we can kind of practice this, especially in busy practices of ourselves or even the surgeons. And there's some, um, you know, there's a gap in between both office visits. I think for me, regardless of what the pretest probability is, you know, like you mentioned, if there's any sort of infection that needs to be addressed, it may start antibiotics kind of right away, especially if you saw the drainage. But then getting that pelvic MRI before they even see the surgeon, I think can actually help a lot, not just in diagnosing it, but even following that fistula down the road after getting therapy so that our radiologists can help us out 
and saying, okay, this is what it was before therapy and how is it going three months, six months down the road? Because if some of these patients need to end up going to surgery, then at least we have a, a trajectory or baseline of objective findings and radiographic imaging that can help kind of tell us, okay, how are we doing with therapy? Where do we need to target when we go in there for surgery? So most of the time I may start antibiotics. I may get that pelvic MRI. And then end up, they end up going to the colorectal surgeon, who then may not need to even do that repeat MRI. They just go straight to exam under anesthesia. Sometimes even get that uh, endoscopic ultrasound done at the same time as exam under anesthesia. But at least they have an MRI to kind of go off of in, in, in the sense that if they end up going down the surgical route in the future, then at least they already have that MRI to help. And again, that based off that study, any time you combine one of these two tests, it just helps increase that accuracy and helps you follow them down the road too. That's a, that's a fair point. Unfortunately, in our health system, if we order an M, MR pelvis, uh, oftentimes it ends up happening weeks down the line, uh, wh- unless you order it stat, which I don't think this would technically be a stat indication. But still, yeah, I mean, it's it's always better to have more testing, and certainly if you have that before the surgery appointment, um, that's helpful for the surgeons, I would imagine. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think... A lot of what we try to do and can do is <laughs> dictated by somebody else um, or other higher entities. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's always nice to have kind of a surgical roadmap done ahead of time. Right. And another point I wanted to make is these non perianal fistulas. As you mentioned, a lot of times they're hard to detect on imaging. Sometimes they're only, they're only discovered at the time of surgery. Like they'll just happen to see one once they're doing like an ileal resection. They'll happen to see some bowel matted together and there would happen to be a fistula between them because you know i think of these uh more internal fistulas especially when they're just involving bowel it depends on like what how much bowel is being bypassed by that fistula with regard to if it's going to cause symptoms or not like for example an iliosigmoid fistula can can sometimes lead to diarrhea because instead of most of the stool going through most of the colon, um, it can bypass most of the colon, just end up in the sigmoid, and then you can get diarrhea. So that's, um, or it can lead to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth too. So bloating, um, abdominal pain, that type of thing can be a symptom. So you need a high index of suspicion for it. Um, but yeah, admittedly, it's it's difficult to detect. Uh, and we know you do we do the best we can with the imaging studies we have like CT enterography or MR enterography. Right. And I would agree. I think, you know, although the enterocolonic, enteroenteric fistulas are a bit more uh, common, or again, frequency up to maybe 30%, not that high. Um, although they're a bit more common, uh, they are a bit more difficult to diagnose. Some of the less frequent ones like a rectovaginal or enterovesical fistula, although less common, these patients end up having certain symptoms where it, it makes it a bit more easier to diagnose. Um, yeah, tell and, us tell yeah. us about that. The the symptoms to expect with a fistula from bowel to bladder or fistula from uh, rectum to vagina. Yeah, so I mean something like a colovesical fistula. Um, again, a lot of your the way to diagnose this, I mean, your pretest probability can be very high, but just based on certain symptoms. So something like pneumaturia, if you're passing, you know, air when you're urinating, or if you're passing stool when you're trying to urinate, you know, they can be up to 50 to 95 percent of these cases with the air. It can be up to 40 to 70 percent of cases with, you know, stool in the urine. Um, some of the more non-specific ones of, you know, having suprapubic pain, some dysuria, urgency, frequency. You know, some of those things are kind of more uh, nonspecific, a little bit more sen- – but when you have new materia, fecal urea in the right setting, I mean, your pretest probability can be quite high. And so if you suspect that fistula, um, you know, a CT scan is a great test to help kind of diagnose that. It's just how you end up ordering the CT, te- CT scan – um, can can play the biggest role. So you don't want to use IV contrast. So IV contrast is going to be eliminated through your kidneys. And so if that excretion from the bladder, you know, the contrast is going to the bladder, you're not going to really know um, where that contrast is coming from. You're going to kind of confuse where did that contrast come from. Was it your IV or was it because there's a fistula somewhere? And so um, to kind of get the best picture, you want to use oral contrast and a combination of rectal contrast, and that will give you a higher yield of finding that colovesical fistula. Uh, now, obviously, if you have diverticula, um, sometimes that can 
change things. If you have air in the bladder, your pretest probability can change. Um, obviously, air in the bladder with not having any prior instrumentation, your pretest probability goes a little higher. Um, if your colon and the bladder wall, like the planes, the fat planes in between them, if there's lack of those and there's some bladder wall thickening and your colon is sitting right near there, again, your pretest probability goes up a bit higher. So symptoms um, plus the CT scan with the oral rectal contrast, no IV contrast, your, I mean, your, your diagnostic accuracy can go I mean, up to almost 90% or up to 100%. Um, and it's actually interesting with, with colovesical fistulas. There's there's uh, two other interesting tests, not probably routinely done as much anymore, but there was a urologist um, several years ago, and there was a study published in, like, in the 1980s called the Born Test. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but it was pretty interesting. Um, so pretty much what they did was um, they took a sample of urine specimen that was obtained by like, a catheter after they gave a barium enema. And so pretty much they centrifuged this urine sediment uh, on a cas- an x-ray cassette, and they just compare all the specimens together. And if there's a presence of this you know, radiopaque barium uh, settling down at the bottom, then you know that there's probably a fistulous communication between the bowel and the bladder, right? So if you're giving a barium enema and having that end up in your urine, clearly there's going to be some form of connection. And so they took like, you know, 10 patients, not a lot, but um, this test was positive in nine out of the 10 patients. And in seven of these patients, this born test, this was actually the only test that was positive outside from diagnosing it during surgery. So, you know, doing CTs and x-rays and all these other sorts of imaging testing, you know, they, they didn't capture all of the patients who had this fistula. Um, you do the born test and boom, technically you had a 90% um, accuracy of diagnosing these patients with uh, colovesicular fistula. Mm. Yeah, that's that's an old school test. I, I had yeah. not heard of it before you presented this, and uh, I don't think anyone no. is doing it now. But yeah, it seems yeah. Seem, yeah. Make, seems to make sense. Yeah, even even another one, relatively similar concept, is a, like a poppy seed test, where patients would just um, eat these black poppy seeds, and then they would have a catheter, and they would look in the catheter bag, drainage fully catheter drainage bag, and see, hey, are the seeds in there? And this was actually very specific as well, too, to diagnose it. Uh, I have a study done in kind of uh, about 20 years ago, and they looked at this, and the Papacy test caught all 11 patients who had the fistula. We had CT caught a, like three, a cystography caught a couple, barium enema caught a couple. Uh, so an interesting concept, um, probably not as used almost uh, anywhere now, I think. Yeah, I, I, I love these old school tests because they um, obviously are much cheaper than right. the tests we do now, no radiation exposure. And just for the patients, what we mean by this test is you just eat a bunch of poppy seeds. And if there isn't a connection between your bowel and the bladder, those tiny poppy seeds, at least some of them should end up in the bladder. So if you have a Foley or a catheter in your bladder and we evaluate what the urine looks like after you swallow these poppy, poppy seeds, uh, then it's suggestive of an abnormal connection or a fistula. So that's really cool. That's uh, I'm I'm waiting for the opportunity to try this. Actually, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> somebody maybe, to... maybe they'll bring them to our institution. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know, one thing I think uh, you had on one of your slides is the sometimes cystoscopy, like a a urologist will do a scope within your bladder to see if you actually have a fistula, and that is pretty accurate. Um, and then also during endoscopy, we can actually spray like a blue dye or, and see if it ends up in your urine. Like while we're up in your colon, we can, you know, instill some methylene blue and see if you end up urinating blue. Then we know there's a, uh, a connection. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I mean, these tests are pretty simple to do too. When we're doing the endoscopy, we can just flush them inside the lumen really quick and see if, you know, especially if they already had that Foley catheter, see if it drains out. Right. Uh, but in general, you know, doing colonoscopy, cystoscopy, cystogram, you know, the sensitivity for detecting these fistulas are kind of variable. Um, I think it's sometimes operator dependent and just depends on the fistula itself. Um, theoretically, with a cystogram, if there's enough force kind of putting in that contrast, you would hope you can see that uh, filling of the fistula. But sometimes if there's so much edema and inflammation going on at the fistula site, you may not have that contrast go through through that cystogram. 
and kind of it's, same thing. Mm-hmm. it's very difficult to see fistulas endoscopically at, at least from the side of the bowel it's like very difficult usually they're not like these big gaping holes that you can see i mean they're it's it's very difficult Right, and that's where some of the concept of the barium enema comes into play too. Some would say that maybe that contrast agent is too viscous, and not you know can't go through, penetrate through that fistula's opening to even catch that fistula. Mm. Great. All right, so let's keep going. Yeah. So I mean, that's kind of the you know fistulas uh, fistulas one hundred and one, the bread and butter of it. And I think now, kind of getting into the realm of the pharmacotherapy for fistulizing the disease is probably you know. Where, where the meat of this talk is and you know it's 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 interesting because a lot of the data that we have on fistulizing disease comes from subgroup analyses or post hoc analysis uh, from you know some of the other bigger trials uh, in most of these trials um, they comment more on perianal Crohn's disease not as much on internal penetrating disease so therapy for internal penetrating disease kind of stems from just treating luminal disease and then the a lot of the management for perianal disease comes not just comes majority from the bigger trials, but as secondary endpoints. So there's very few studies and not a lot of randomized control studies out there dedicated to intestinal type. And there's not a lot of studies out there where fistulizing disease is the sole primary endpoint. Uh, most of them are secondary endpoints, or they're all stemmed from sub subac analyses. So. Um, some of the you know data we're about to get into, most of these recommendations combine all forms of fistulizing disease, internal and external, um, and that's kind of where our data comes from. And we'll talk about a couple that are you know in particular focused more on fistulizing disease. Um, so l- l- let me just explain why that's important. So you know f- from a from a patient perspective, it's important to know that there's different qualities of evidence, and the one of the highest quality types of evidence addressing this specific question is uh, a study where it's like a randomized, you know, blinded, placebo-controlled trial looking at if fistulas have, you know, decreased drainage or healing of fistulas. Um, And and as we'll go through a little bit later, there's there's pretty much only one of those studies that I know of. Um, But that that's much stronger evidence and that tells you that you know what you're seeing is likely true as far as whatever the result of that study is but then for a lot of the most of the other you know indirect ways to determine if a medicine works for fistulas is like looking back in time or looking at studies that were primarily designed to look just at Crohn's disease in general like the inflammation in the bowel rather than fistulas themselves and then seeing, oh, let's only look at this subgroup of patients that had fistulas that was enrolled in the trial, and let's see what happened to their fistulas looking back in time. Uh, And that's not very strong evidence. At best, it's something that can generate hypotheses, like that, oh, this may be something to look into with a a real randomized controlled trial, a randomized controlled placebo controlled trial. Um, But you can't really say for sure if something works based on just doing subgroup analyses, because you may not have enough patients to answer that question, um, and you're not adequately controlling. There could be confounders, et cetera. You, so that's where this is important, where we derive uh, our answers as far as what actually works for this and what may work, and we don't know. Right, right. Yeah, no, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, and that's important kind of you know, moving forward. And so I'll start off by, again, kind of like the initial assessment of when you see these patients, and we kind of alluded to this before, is you really want to make sure before any of these patients end up on any form of immunosuppressive or immunomodulator therapy that um, their infection is healed and well-controlled. So we want to make sure none of these patients are suffering from any systemic inflammatory response from their infection as well. And so antibiotics um, have been around for a while. They play a huge role. Um, you know, the, the concept there is you want to improve their fistula symptoms. If these are simple or superficial perianal fistulas, so there's minimal penetration going on, antibiotics can help um, treat these. Now, they may re- rarely replace the need for some form of, you know, surgical drainage, like a CETON, things like that. 
Uh, but they do at least jumpstart the process and the healing um, of these. And there's not many control studies out there to comment on whether they heal non-perianal fissualizing disease. Most of this is for perianal fissualizing disease. Um, in general, antibiotics are not you know, long-term monotherapy. These are more as a bridge or adjuvant therapy when you're combining these at some point with the immunomodulator or biologic. Um, so here it's more of a concept of an adjunctive role in treating that perianal infection. There's a couple of antibiotics out there that have been looked at, um, but again, there's no real like clinical guidelines on antibiotic selection that exist. You know, something like ciprofloxacin probably has higher rates of clinical improvement in complete fistula closure when you compare it to something like uh, metronidazole. Um, although the studies that were done on that, they didn't really reach uh, a lot of significance. So, you know, that, neither one is more effective than the other um, than you know placebo in achieving complete fistula closure. Uh, but again, the concept there is you're attacking the more common bugs that would probably be in that region. Levofloxacin is another antibiotic that could also be used. Typically use these for about a month or two, take them a couple times a day depending on the antibiotic, and hopes that it helps kind of control that infection. So the, the way I conceptualize antibiotics is I, I don't consider them effective to close fistulas, but it's mainly to address symptoms, decrease the... Uh, amount of drainage. Of course, in combination with other therapies, it can help to boost the effect. But by themselves, right, I, I don't think they will close fistulas by themselves, but may just help with the symptoms. Um, and, you know, the trials I looked at uh, usually use like 12 weeks of Cipro. Um, but as you mentioned, metronidazole, Cipro, or, or levofloxacin are, are options. Right, right. Yeah, that's definitely important to know, too, especially when, you know, talking to patients that antibiotics is not going to make the fistula go away. It's really just going to help with a lot of the symptoms. Right. Um, and then getting into, you know, the immunomodulator type therapies. So thiopurines, you know, these, these have been around for a while. They've been commonly used for the treatment of perianal fistulas. Um, over time, and at least a lot of these studies, you know, some of the bigger ones, the prospective randomized controlled trial came from 1980 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Another big meta-analysis that was done was in 1995. So these medications have been around for a while. And a lot of them, in a the nutshell, have been shown to reduce the symptoms of perianal fistulizing disease and perianal fistulas. Um, six mercaptopurine has been effective at inducing complete fistula healing. Um, when you kind of break it down to the numbers, um, you know, it may have closed fistulas in nine out of 21 patients as compared to placebo, which is one out of, you know, that number. So not the, the number of people in these studies have never been super high where there's hundreds and hundreds of patients. They're very small studies. Um, and a lot, again, a lot of the data is coming from a subgroup analysis, especially of this randomized controlled trial. And so it was effective in, uh, symptoms. But sometimes they're not completely effective in, in healing or closing that fistula. Um, a meta-analysis that was done you know, in, in the 1990s um, of patients with perianal disease, they were treated with either one 6 mercaptopurine or azathioprine. And these patients had clinical improvement maybe when 21% of the patients who received placebo versus people who actually took the medication, which is up to like 54%. So, you know, there is some data out there to support that it can help with symptoms. It can help try to close these fistulas, especially if they're draining. Um, but again, a lot of the studies that were done are a bit older, um, took a little longer to have these treated. And then these medications themselves um, come with a lot of, you know, side effects. You have to monitor labs, the patient themselves. They could be a risk of other infections, their liver, things like that. Um, but there is some decent data out there to support that they can be, you know, azathioprine and 6 mercaptopurine are both effective for treating fistulizing disease. Yeah, there's, there's been a movement to use less and less of thiopurines, azathioprine, and 6-MP as monotherapy just by itself. Um over the years, something I've noticed. Generally, I, I think most people would say that it's probably less effective than some of the biologics we have, but sometimes it's it's a reasonable option if there's insurance issues because it's an old medicine, it's cheap, it doesn't require insurance prior authorization, and it's also a pill which some people feel is more realistic and something they can get their mind, they can wrap their minds around being on more long term. But I do think if you're going to use azathioprine or 6-MP as monotherapy for this, 
for perianal or any kind of fistulizing Crohn's, you should use drug monitoring. Like, um, I often see a lot of patients who come to me who are like underdosed. They're not getting like the right dose of the medicine. And there's arguments that have been made that weight-based dosing doesn't really make sense uh, with thiopurines based on, you know, the pharmacokinet- pharmacokinetics and, you know, TPMT and kind of how your body metabolizes the drug. It really has nothing to do with your weight. Um, but if you measure and metabolize something called 6-TG, um, usually the medicine reaches steady state in your system anywhere from at two to four weeks. If you check the 6-TG level and you want it to be above about 240, 250, uh, just to make sure you're getting the right amount of drug. And I acknowledge the data behind this is a little bit wishy-washy as far as if that really makes a difference, doing therapeutic drug monitoring for azathioprine, but still, I think it makes sense in this context. Yeah, no, definitely. I think I agree. And I think, you know, regardless of how you're really using these medications, I think there's definitely a role for the therapeutic monitoring, especially if they start having some abnormalities in their biochemical profile. It's always worth having some of those metabolites checked. And then, so moving on, I mean, there's a, there's not a lot of data out there regarding methotrexate in its regard to effect on perianal disease. There's no real specific study out there that compares methotrexate versus placebo for fistula remission. Um, there was a case series done that, uh, you know, almost like 15, 20 years ago that looked at um, methotrexate and its efficacy. Um, and again, it was like a subgroup analysis of a randomized controlled trial. Um, and then subsequent case series were done. And methotrexate may have been... Uh, a little bit more effective than placebo. So, I mean, 25% of these patients had fistula closure, 31% had a fistula improvement in symptoms. But it was interesting because this study really looked at uh, intramuscular methotrexate. And when you switch from IM to PO or even decrease the dose, the fistula recurrence came back. So the authors of that study didn't really know how, what to make of that, why IM and PO, there was such a great difference. Um, but in general, that's kind of the limited data that we have on methotrexate. And they looked at these patients over like a four or five month time period. Um, and, and so, again, very limited, not really used as much in perianal disease. It shouldn't be used as a monotherapy for perianal disease. Um, I think if you are going to use some form of immunomodulator in an individual, if you can not use methotrexate in fistula disease, that's probably preferable. Um, just given that we don't have as much data out there to support its use in perianal disease. Yeah, methotrexate is, um, as far as just using it as monotherapy for Crohn's disease itself, it's it's relatively rare. We don't see many circumstances where that's utilized. I use it sometimes, but yeah, you're right. Technically, the bioavailability, meaning how much of the drug gets in your system from the oral form versus the injectable form is relatively similar, but the data does suggest injectable form uh, is probably more effective for induction and maintenance. Um, So usually you do 25 milligrams a week along with folic acid, one milligram a day. A lot of people get, you know, nausea from it, so that can can limit your use. Sometimes you can treat through that with Zofran or do think different things with the dosing, like do divided dosing. Um, sometimes it can cause fatigue. So uh, side effect profile as far as symptoms from the medicine are not great, but uh, it doesn't seem to have a, ri- a higher risk of lymphoma, which is why sometimes people prefer that. I recently had a patient uh, who was considering doing azathioprine or methotrexate because multiple biologics um, weren't working. We were kind of running out of options. And uh, he has a family history of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and his father. So although that's not an absolute contraindication to using azathioprine, or that's not like a guarantee you're going to get lymphoma from the medicine, but still he was sufficiently risk-averse to the point that we opted for methotrexate instead Although he already has issues with nausea, so I don't know how how um, how he's going to tolerate it. Yeah, that's, that's a tough case, and that's always um, you know that's an obstacle we run into with methotrexate. But um, definitely reasonable to avoid a thiopurine in that setting too. Um, I don't I don't blame him. 
Um, another med- medication out there I want to briefly talk about is uh, cyclosporin. And so there's been multiple randomized placebo-controlled trials that have evaluated the efficacy of cyclosporin in patients with Crohn's. None have specifically focused on fistula closure, though, as a primary endpoint. And so some of the data that we have is quite limited. They come from a few case series. Um, I think we know of cyclosporin's role more in you know, the acute, severe ulcerative colitis that are refractory to steroid settings. But in setting of moderate to severe Crohn's or fistulizing Crohn's, not a lot of data out there. And so what we do know is that it's probably best used as an IV rescue bridge therapy to something long-term, some long-term immunomodulator or biologic therapy. Um, as most do have an initial response to it, but then the majority do end up relapsing once you kind of do take away the cyclosporin. And so there's an interesting study that was done, um, again, a little while ago in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, uh, where they looked at you know ev- evaluating fistula closure in patients with IV cyclosporin. And up to 78% of these patients showed you know, a partial clinical response. However, 71 of those, 71% of those patients ultimately who were converted to oral from IV all relapsed in their disease. And so some of the conclusions we've drawn with IV cyclo is that when you convert, they'll probably lose response. And so in general, when you do take these patients off of the uh, uh, cyclosporin in general, because of obviously the medication and its risk profile, uh, a lot of these patients do end up relapsing with their fistulizing disease. So if anything, it's a good bridge to something else to kind of maintain their disease or treat them. Yeah, as you were just talking, I Googled uh, uh, a study. I was familiar with, there actually was another randomized controlled trial, placebo-controlled trial looking at tancrolimus. Um, another calcineurin inhibitor works in a similar way as cyclosporin, but it's an oral medicine, which um, is maybe more an attractive option for some patients. And uh, this was published in 2003 in Gastroenterology. Uh, it was a study, you know, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multicenter clinical trial um, published by Sanborn, as first author. And uh, it was 48 patients with Crohn's, and they were randomized to oral tacrolimus, 0.2 milligrams per kilograms per day versus placebo for 10 weeks. And ultimately, their conclusion was that it was effective for fistula improvement, but not fistula remission. So whatever ways they define that. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I think calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus, and uh, cal- uh, cyclosporin can be bridges to other therapies if you just need some acute control of the the issue but in clinical practice it's pretty much never used for that purpose i i've never really seen that i don't really use it for that purpose i use cyclosporin mostly for severe acute ulcerative colitis refractory to steroids especially if they have a low albumin or i also use it um as pretty much when I'm out of options, like all medications have not worked, then I'll use tacrolimus for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, but it usually should be a bridge to something else because it's not a very safe medicine to be on long-term, although sometimes we still do it. Right, right. And I think we see it more in you know, some of our transplant uh, patients, liver transplant patients and things, but again, the circumstances are a bit different in that setting um, here, we're fortunate that we have a series of options that we can try to bridge these patients to, which kind of segues me now into some of the you know biologic therapies that we have out there. So, you know, some of these medications I'm going to go over are uh, some of the TNF antagonists like infliximab, adalimumab, sertilizumab. Um, they all have like therapeutic drug, drug targets, vitalizumab, Um Mainly, I'll, I'll be discussing some of these. Um, we all kind of know that you know, they have specific drug targets with infliximab being the TNF-alpha, vetalizumab being the alpha-4, beta-7, and I'll get into that. Isokinumab targeting some of the interleukins 12 and 23. Um, so starting with infliximab, um, you know, most so for, of them, Just uh-huh. before you start, yeah. if you could, um, just for the patients who are listening, when you mention a medicine like infliximab, can you also mention like the brand names? And if you don't know, I'll, I'll fill you in, but I think you should know most of these. Yeah, of course. Um, so we'll start with infliximab or, you know, Remicade um, and Flectra, depending on what, what you're taking. Uh, majority of our data is, 
great for infliximab. I mean, these are strong data that we have for this medication. Most of the other medications I'm going to talk about is very low or low certainty of evidence available for them, uh, probably because they come from, again, subgroup analyses and the data is kind of sparse on them. Uh, but something like infliximab um, has been looked into specifically against placebo and fissionalizing disease, and the strongest body of evidence supporting its use for fissional closure is actually for infliximab as well. And so one of the initial studies uh, that present and his group came out with in 1999 is a randomized placebo-controlled trial. And what they did was they took um, uh, infliximab, or again, Remicade, Infliximab, at 5 milligrams per kilogram, and they gave it at zero. So, you know, your first day, they gave it at two weeks, and they gave it at six weeks. And in this initial study, that, that regimen led to pretty much the cessation of all drainage of perianal fistulas on two consecutive visits that were one month apart. And they defined it as a complete closure. And that happened in a majority of the patients. And so, again, this was in New England Journal of Medicine in 1999. There was a subsequent study done, and this is probably the one that a lot more people are familiar with, the ACCENT 2 trial. This was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2004. Um, it was a subsequent large randomized controlled trial. It was a randomized double blind. And what they, saw, they, what, what they did was they continued this regimen every eight weeks. So same dosing at five milligrams per kilogram every eight weeks for maintenance to look at complete closure and response. And, and the way that study was done, they defined it as more than 50% closure when they clinically assess these patients. And this essentially confirmed the efficacy of infliximab for induction and maintenance. At week 54, complete healing was seen in 36% of these patients as compared to only 19% in the placebo group. And this was statistically significant, and the conclusion is drawn was that this is effective in maintaining fistula remission at 54 weeks. Um, again, this is the ACCENT2 trial, which is a Crohn's disease clinical trial evalu evaluating infliximab in a new long-term treatment regimen in patients with fistulizing Crohn's disease. So a few comments I had about XN2. This is a very important trial. This is what I was referencing before is pretty much the only study. I mean, there's a couple other ones we mentioned, but this was this is like the main study and the basis for why most GIs recommend either Remicade and Flectra, the biosimilar for if you have perianal or fistulizing Crohn's disease. So... Um, a few subtle points about this is this this number that's referenced at week 54, 36, complete healing was seen in 36%. And I believe the definition of complete healing was cessation of all drainage from the fistulas. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that, there, I guess there's some debate on does that actually mean healing or not? Because, uh, I mean, the, the fistula still may be there. It's just not draining. Um but for symptomatic purposes, yes, that's addressing the problem. Uh, but that doesn't take into account that, you know, the induction period, I believe it was about two-thirds of patients had some response to infliximab. And it's of those responders, 36% of those had a complete healing or cessation of drainage by week 54. So if you look at all all comers at the end of a year, it's rough. It's like 20% or less of patients that actually have a response. Um, and I've seen some, some figures like uh, there was another study that showed that, you know, even with initial healing in about 65% of patients with complex perianal disease, uh, only 37% were in remission after a median of 10 hour, 10 year follow up. So the durability of the results is not that good. Uh, but certainly I have patients in my practice who have maintained closure of their fistulas, um, continuing on infliximab for years. Right, right. And I think a lot of this speaks to how difficult it is to treat this disease. Um, you know, it's, we know. The, the degree of inflammation that occurs and trying to get on top of that early rather than later and then being able to maintain that, you know, remission is quite difficult in these patients. And knowing that this is a medication that we have with the strongest evidence, still some of these patients still end up uh, not being completely healed after even after a year. Another subtle point about this trial and how it may be different from other trials you're going to discuss uh, is that there was a, they allowed CETON, like if people had CETONs in place uh, or were on antibiotics, those were allowed to continue during this trial until two weeks. Uh, pretty much 
after that first infusion and then two weeks later, they, the cetons had to be removed, um, which I believe is a study you're going to talk about later called the Enterprise Trial, looking at vetalizumab or Intivio, and that actually still allowed the cetons to stay in, the antibiotics. The antibiotics could continue in the Accent 2. They, they were able to continue that, but they took the cetons out. Uh, so that's just a subtle point. Further further um, leading credence to that, to the infliximab actually being the thing that made the difference rather than aceton that may have just took time to help out with the fistula. Right, right. And that kind of segues us into a little bit about the combination of, you know, antibiotics with the uh, anti-TNF, um, such as infliximab. And it's probably more effective than just using an anti-TNF alone for achieving fistula closure. And again, that concept kind of goes back to what we talked about, that antibiotic is probably inducing that healing process, uh, the inflammatory, the infectious process is trying to help simmer that down. And so the combination of the you know, Remicade or Influxure with antibiotics seems to be a little bit more effective than just um, uh, anti-TNF alone. Um, there is a randomized controlled, double-blind placebo-controlled study that was done a few years ago and it showed that in the clinical response was about 73% in patients with the biologic with ciprofloxacin as compared with just uh, uh, infliximab alone, which is only about 38%. And so I think in general, in clinical practice, we kind of talked about this already, but if you know they have that symptomatic fistula starting on antibiotics and then eventually getting them onto that uh, biologic therapy will help. So a lot of my audience are, are proponents of diet and IBD and, you know, talk about how diet enhances the microbiome. And there's also been studies in the past looking at antibiotics in pediatric Crohn's and how antibiotics in childhood may lead to a more uh, difficult to treat, more surgeries in Crohn's disease. So it's, it's a balance as far as using antibiotics for this Um I still think there is a place here because uh, the data suggests it's helpful, but I do worry about the use of repeated courses of antibiotics and Crohn's and how that may affect Crohn's disease long term. But you're already dealing with a, a very severe complication of Crohn's with fistula, so I think you really should, when you have the opportunity, to throw the kitchen sink at it, and that includes antibiotics. Right, right. No, I agree, and I think... Again, that could be even, you know, diet and how it plays a role here. It could be another topic of discussion for later as well, too. But you're right. I mean, when you kind of have – when you when you have this such severity of disease, um, your options do become a little bit limited. Um, and then, yeah, it, you referred to this a little bit already, but, you know, using something like infliximab with Ceton, there is better overall fistula healing response. You do have a longer duration of fistula closure, prevention of any repeated abscesses. Um, and there are some studies that show that you do have lower, lower overall fistula recurrence rate as well once you have that ceton in place to help drain that uh, abscess. So you know, for, for the patients out there who are not familiar with cetons, um, can you just give us a brief uh, kind of well, what is a ceton and what is it doing? Yeah, and I think the way I kind of conceptualize cetons in my mind is you pretty much have, you know, like this infection and you need to get source control. You need to kind of alleviate this uh, pocket of an infection. So if you can place this, how, I mean, it's, it's like a, I sometimes think of it as like a shoelace almost. You kind of have the shoelace going in from one end and out the other end in that fistulous tract that helps promote more of the drainage and clearance of that ongoing infection while you're medically treating it with a, uh, some sort of therapy, antibiotic, what have you, uh, while you're trying to address that source of infection with draining it without having to physically go in there every single day, but just leaving that shoelace in there to help promote the drainage. Right, yeah. It's just a loop of material, whatever it, whatever they choose to use, silk or um, I don't know the specific materials, but it's a loop. Sometimes it's, it look, almost looks like a rubber band. Um, but it goes through the openings, so there's pretty much a loop of material through the whole circuit. And like you said, it's something that helps to, you know, the whatever pus or infectious substances to drain out of that tract. Um, but also, it it helps to prevent it from, because like these fistulas tend to heal from the outside in. Uh, 
And if it does that prematurely before their source control, as you mentioned, abscesses can form again, and then and then you you're back to having the same problem where even more fistulas can branch off from that, and it can be a, a bad situation. So, the seton is really pretty much standard of care nowadays um, to put put those through the tracks to again help with source control, as you mentioned. Right. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I mean, infliximab plus aceton, you know, like I mentioned, it's it's better overall healing response and rates and lower recurrence rates too. Now, in terms of infliximab plus immunomodulator therapy, so like some, you know the thiopurines that we just previously talked about, so we know the combination of these is superior to just a monotherapy in luminal disease, and we know this that comes from the, the Sonic trial. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of studies out there that evaluate the efficacy of the same dual therapy in patients with perianal or intestinal fistulas. Now, we kind of stem some conclusions or draw conclusions or hypothesize that if a combination therapy is superior in luminal disease, then it may be plausible that a combination therapy would also improve fistula closure rates as well, too. Um, but again, we don't have that uh, that strong evidence to support combination therapy with immunomodulated therapy for fistulizing disease like we do for luminal disease. Yeah, I, I agree. I think if you're going to use Remicade or Inflectra for fistulizing disease, it makes sense to add on the immunomodulator. I know a lot of patients don't like that. I mean, it, it is it is a lot to deal with from the patient perspective as far as being start being started on two medications i think some this is not like an appreciated thing because when you when you get on azathioprine you have to check labs like every two weeks right. some, sometimes some gis want it every week for like a month or two and then eventually you have to do it every three months um so that that's that's a lot that's a time commitment <laughs> Um, and then also the risk the risk profile of azathioprine with lymphoma and skin cancer and pancreatitis and uh, all these things I, I think it probably does has the least favorable side effect profile in my opinion um, at, at, except for prednisone prednisone is probably worse but the the combination does make sense in this context because you decrease the risk of antibodies which if you develop antibodies to Inflic, uh, Inflectra or Remicade, then you're in trouble because you've burned a bridge with the medicine that's supposed to be the most effective for this, again, very challenging manifestation of Crohn's. Uh, and then you, then you have to you know, go to subsequent biologics that probably won't work as well. Um, and there's always the option to potentially take the immunomodulator off in the future, depending on your drug levels and things like that. So, I mean, generally the way I do most fistulizing Crohn's disease first presentation I'm I'm doing you know NITNF Remicator Inflectra plus azathioprine plus antibiotics uh, for two or three months Cipro is usually what I use Um, and then I'm also doing prospective therapeutic drug monitoring meaning I'm checking drug levels at two to four weeks I'm checking a 6TG level to make sure it's above you know, 250 or so for the azathioprine. I'm checking an infliximab trough, and there's controversy. When's the best time to check it? I'm still checking it before the fourth dose, uh, and I want it, which is the, before the first maintenance dose, and I want it above 10, at least 10, maybe even above 15, um, and uh, adjusting the dose accordingly. Right. Yeah. I mean, we kind of, kind of. I think we hit the nail on this already. That this is definitely a challenging disease, and you want to do what you can to get these patients under control sooner rather than later, so that their quality of life can also improve. And it does unfortunately come at the expense of you know frequent doctor visits or lab visits, things like that, or you know like the drug monitoring, like you mentioned. But given that the strongest evidence that we have is for this medication, I would try to use it as long as possible. Um, you know, another medication kind of in a similar family is adalimumab. Um, not as thoroughly studied as, as, as infliximab or adalimumab being Humira, but some of the studies that we do have, it's kind of like a 50-50. Some of them are, show that it can be effective in treating uh, perianal fistulas. Um, you know, there's another one that I'm going to briefly talk about, sertilizumab uh, or Simzia. You know, if you had a choice, you probably want to pick Humira over Simzia. So Humira still has uh, some evidence to support it. 
Um, now, it's a lot of the studies with Humira and perianal facial closure, Humira or perianal facial closure in studies with Humira, it was not the primary endpoint. Um, so again, a lot of the study that we have here is coming from a post hoc or you know secondary analysis. Um, there's two studies that use Humira. One of them being, you know, the post hoc analysis was done based off the classic study or the clinical assessment of adalimumab safety and efficacy studied in the induction of therapy in Crohn's disease. And that study on that post hoc analysis showed there was like no benefit over placebo for facial closure. Um, and then, but in, you know, so, in subsequent randomized control studies and some of the other analyses that, re, that they did, um, in general, there was facial improvement in almost, you know, 75% of these patients compared to placebo. Uh, there was complete closure in some of these patients with Humira. Um, but it gets a little tricky when you do these subgroup analyses and then they look at and they rerun the numbers and then it shows maybe it wasn't as effective in inducing complete fistula closure. Uh, but because we do have some of this initial data out there that does show there is some clinical improvement in complete fistula closure, if, in, if uh, you know, Remicade or Infectra is not an option and you want to stay within the family, then Humira uh, would definitely be the second option in that family. Great. Okay. And then, you know, Simsia, I, I, I won't go too much into this, but again, it's like a coin toss, right? Some of the studies show that it wasn't significantly higher closure rates compared to placebo. Um, you know, complete closure rates with Simsia was not significantly better compared to placebo. These are some of the, you know, studies that were done in 2007 at New England Journal of Medicine, the precise trial. But in subsequent studies thereafter, there were similar surveys done, things like that. It did show that some patients were having some improvement. Um, but again, there's a lot of variability in the results for, for Simsia, for Sertilizumab. Um, definitely need larger studies to kind of really look at how uh, effective it is in fistulizing disease. Okay. I, I rarely use Simsia. Yeah. Um, just in general. I think I have one, one patient who's on it right now, but uh, it's not, not one that I tend to use much. Right, right. And I think after Remicade and Fluxtra, after Humira, and you still have, you know, a patient whose fistulas are not under control and you need something else, I think this is where we can kind of segue into some of these other uh, biologics that we now have. So Ustekinumab or Stellara. So this is a monoclonal antibody. Um, this was approved by the FDA for use in Crohn's in 2016. Some may know of it because of its use in psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. Um, so this is an antibody that binds like this common P40 subunit of certain interleukins 12 and 23. And essentially what it's doing is it's pretty much simmering down that huge inflammatory response that we talked about a little earlier. It kind of tells the T cells to kind of calm down and that activation of those T cells slows down and that whole inflammatory cascade uh, simmers down there as well too. Um, now, data with this medication in perianal fistulizing disease is still a little limited. Small patient numbers, um, they're coming from retrospective studies or secondary analyses. Uh, there's low patient numbers, and the lack of you know real con control groups for comparison really make the data a little bit difficult to interpret. Um, but the data that we do have, it looks a little promising. It, it's definitely a, a solid option. Um, and we talked about this a little earlier too, a lot, that you could take this data and maybe postulate that further studies using this medication in perineal fistulizing disease may actually be worthwhile in doing. Um, so some of the studies that we have come from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012 called the Certified Trial. That was a double-blind placebo-controlled study. They did a subgroup analysis based on that study, and it showed that fistula healing rates were significantly higher in treatment group, about 47%, compared to the placebo, which was about 30% after about 22 weeks. Um, there was another study done called the UNITY trial. This was uh, for induction and for maintenance. This was this came out in 2016 in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, this was another double-blind placebo-controlled trial. An official response was seen at about 80% compared with only 46% uh, in placebo group after about 44 weeks. And so um, in 2017, they kind of pooled all of this data, the certified from 2012, the unity from 2016, and they pulled all these patients together, and they did another uh, subgroup analysis of all that just to kind of see how effective it was. And it showed that the complete healing rate uh, occurred in about 14% of placebo versus about 24% of patients on uh, Stellara or Ostekinumab at eight weeks. And so they felt that, you know, there is some data out there to suggest that Stellara can be used for fistulizing disease. 
Um, and there's, you know, there's been a case series done afterwards. There is this open label study done a little bit afterwards, and it all is showing that, you know, using this sub-Q medication after a few months it can uh, help these patients with perineal fistulizing disease. Great. And then you're going to talk about vetalizumab, right? Until right, you... right. Okay. And that's the one I'll probably end with because, you know, like I said, I want to kind of touch upon some of the big bigger medications that we have today. So vetalizumab, this was approved by the FDA for moderate to severe Crohn's in 2014, so just a little bit before uh, Stellara. So vetalizumab is in Tivio. This is a monoclonal antibody. This targets, so kind of getting to uh, nuts and greens of it, but it kind of targets the intestinal-specific leukocytes. So there's certain uh, inflammatory cells within the gut, kind of specific to the gut. And this uh, medication selectively binds to certain proteins and uh, molecules on those inflammatory cells. And it pretty much prevents it from traveling and going down further into the blood vessels of the GI tract. There are certain uh, um, proteins that are expressed a little bit more than others, especially even sometimes in the distal rectum the vascular supply of the anal canal and the distal rectum, uh, some of those proteins are also expressed there. And so the thought process in general is that this medication kind of specifically targets these gut proteins and helps simmer down the inflammation going on there. And so vitalizumab initially, you know, the studies that came out, they did a randomized parallel group double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And what they did was they kind of took out some patients who – you know, already had abdominal abscesses, they already had intestinal strictures, or they already had chronic resections, or a lot of resections in general, they had stomas. They excluded those patients. Uh, they took, like, there was about 220 patients in this to begin with that got the vetalizumab. Then they took people who responded to this. Um, if all the patients in the trial that received the initial therapy, those had a clinical response, where they were actually re-randomized. Um, and you got the medication again, and when you were re-randomized, you got it every four weeks, every eight weeks, or you got the placebo. And so they found that at 52 weeks, the official closure rate was actually higher for the patients who were getting it every eight weeks compared to those who were getting it every four weeks. And it, it was about 41% of those who were getting it every eight weeks compared to the placebo, which was about, about 11%. So even though the you know the maintenance phase didn't reach statistical significance, getting it every four weeks, getting that dose at week ten did increase their clinical response, who didn't really respond um, at week six in general. So there was this minimal impact on official closure um, if you got the medication every eight weeks as compared to placebo. So the conclusions drawn from this was that hey, it actually works. And at 52 weeks in the maintenance group, they were receiving it every eight weeks. The official closure was, like I mentioned, was about 41% as compared to 11% in the placebo group. Now, subsequently, a couple years later, they did another subhawk analysis, what we call an exploratory analysis of this data from the Gemini 2 trial. And they found that about 12% of the, so the 12% of the patients had actively draining fistulas. And by week 14, about 28% who were being treated with vetalizumab um, had achieved fistula closure compared to just 11% who got vetalizumab and then got a placebo, meaning they were not being maintained on placebo. When they re-looked at all, this, all these patients again at week 52, they found that 31% of patients who were continued on vetalizumab had achieved fistula closure as compared to only 11% who were in who got that initial vetalism out but did not get the maintenance of uh, Intivio, only 11% of those achieved facial closure. So there was a, you know, pe pe patients were getting this Intivio drug induction therapy plus the maintenance therapy every eight weeks. There was a faster time to facial closure, and they were more likely to have their facial close at around week 52. Now, unfortunately, a lot of this data was not statistically significant, so kind of getting more into like the nuts and grains of the research itself. But in general, there were a higher proportion of patients who did get in Tivio and they maintained therapy, um, achieving that official closure by week 52. I've, ne I've never heard of the uh, of nuts and grains. Is it? <laughs> Is that a new saying, or is it nuts and bolts? I thought. That's, that's... I mean, I, I, I kind of you know g took it down to the microscopic level there. The nuts and grains. Oh bolts wow! Bigger than that, you know. I got it. Okay, that's that's cool. I'm gonna use that from now on. <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about the vetalizumab data. Um, 
Oh, and then you're going to talk about the enterprise study, right? Yeah, so th this is actually fairly new. Uh, this just came out just a couple months ago. It was a phase four trial, randomized, double blind, and they compared two doses of vetolizumab compared to the standard. So, with the, so standard being 0, 2, 6, 14, 22. That's kind of essentially what it is, right? After six, you wait the eight weeks, you get at the 14 mark. You wait eight weeks, you get the 22 mark. And then they compared that to giving an additional dose at week 10. So you get your zero, you get your two, you get your six, and then you get another one four weeks later at 10, then you're 14, then you're 22. And these were patients who had moderate, moderately to severe active Crohn's disease. They had draining perianal fistulas. These were patients who either had inadequate response or some form of loss of response, intolerance to conventional therapy, you know, such as to Remicade or Inflectra. Those are these types of patients. Those are the patients that were enrolled. There all about 52 patients. Uh, they actually saw there was no difference observed in the rates of fistula closure at week 30 between the two doses. So although Intivio does promote the fistula closure in these patients with perianal disease, uh, receiving either standard, standard or in the additional dose, they didn't really see, though, that that additional dose altered like the treatment outcome. Obviously, it was a safe drug. The safety profile was consistent with either arm. Uh, but they saw that giving that extra dose really four weeks later after that six week didn't really make too much of a difference. So then that begs the question, should you do it every after that 10 week dose or does it not really matter for the fistulizing disease? When they pulled them all together, there was more than 50 percent reduction from baseline in the number of draining perianal fistulizing disease at week 30. Uh, but that additional dose didn't really make too much of a bang for your buck. So a few thoughts I had about just like Stellara and Intivio for fistulas. Talking from the patient's perspective, um, you know, patients are terrified of side effects of medications. And I think what's sometimes missed is though the evidence suggests that infliximab plus ceton plus azathioprine, potentially plus antibiotics, like that combination is going to be the most effective. From the patient perspective, they're thinking, oh, I don't, I, don't want to be on these medicines because of the side effects. And generally speaking, I, I just did a podcast recently to all patients newly diagnosed that the risks of these medicines, although they're there, they're pretty rare. I mean, Assad, in, in your experience so far seeing IBD patients in the hospital and clinic, have you seen anybody get lymphoma from NITNF so far? No, I have not. I haven't seen in my yeah. career so far. I haven't. I mean, it happens. Obviously, it happens. But the risk of it is so low that. Um, but I get it. I mean, I, I sympathize with that fear, especially if maybe you have family history or know people who've gotten it. It's uh, it can be a scary thing. But if you want the most effective therapy, you're going to go with that. But these other options that don't have as good of a evidence base, but still may work. I mean, I have patients in my practice who have had perianal fistulas that have closed for long periods of time on intivio. But, uh, you know, the, the risk profile of intivio or Stellara compared to anti-TNFs is, I just think, so, so much better. Like, it's, I mean, with Stellara, really, there's no risk compared to placebo. And then specifically when the, within the context of Crohn's disease with intivio, it's really just upper respiratory infections um, not necessarily COVID, but respiratory infections, um, which can be an issue. But other than that, that's not really much. Uh, and even in the long-term extension trials on Intibio, those of respiratory infections go away. So uh, if patients may want to be on these medicines instead. I still think you should go with what works because this is such a difficult thing to treat. And the first biologic you get started on is the most likely to work. Uh, so I would advise people against using Intivio or Stellara first line, even though the side effect profile seems more favorable. Another thing about this enterprise study is that it's different from Accent 2 because there's, it's not placebo controlled. The patients had antibiotics, cetons. So was it really the Intivio or was it more time on antibiotics and more time with the ceton in that led to the improvement we don't know, but it's not as well designed as the XN2 trial. So I still think the evidence is still best for infliximab. Right, right. I agree. And I think depending on the patient population, there's a role for some of these medications. I think sometimes in the elderly, we you know, we are sometimes a little reluctant to use things like Remicade or Infectra. 
um, which can make it a little tricky. You know, I have a patient who she's probably in her 70s now, but she was diagnosed in the 1970s. So she was like 30, 40 some years old and she has fissionalizing disease. She was on immunomodulated therapy for, you know, two, three decades. And then when, you know, the precise or when these trials came out for Remicade in 1999 and then the maintenance therapy, Axon 2, she got some infliximab, didn't really respond, kind of fell off the radar a little bit, uh, but eventually stayed on immunomodulated therapy. And then as she started having all these side effects from it, she got gout, she couldn't really use um, thioprenes anymore. Instead of giving her something like Remicade or Influxra, she got Vitaluzumab, and she's been doing great on that now for the past like five, six years. Yeah, yeah, it does work despite the theoretical concerns, right? Because, right. you know, like al- alpha-4, beta-7, which is what Vitaluzumab or Intibio binds to on white blood cells, the correlate to that is MADCAM. These addressins, that's what the alpha-4, beta-7 is supposed to connect to to get through the blood vessels into the tissue and cause inflammation. But uh, as you said in your presentation, uh, at least when you presented at Grand Rounds, that the there actually isn't MADCAM uh, in the vasculature of the anal canal, right? It's VCAM, right. which you'd think that vetalizumab wouldn't work. But that's why I always stress, like, mechanisms, I'm not so concerned about mechanisms. Oftentimes people bring bring up studies like, oh, this herb works against Crohn's because of, you know, it, you know it's anti-inflammatory in a test tube or something like that. But ultimately it's, it's the results that matter, even if theoretically something may not make sense. Right. I agree. I think patient outcomes, how they feel, what their disease is doing probably matters a bit more. And you're right. I mean, there's more VCAM expression than there is MADCAM expression in the distal rectum. Yet, like you said, somehow it, it, it works. Uh, Vitalizumab is working. Right. All right. So now we're going to talk about non-medical management. Is that right? Sure, yeah. I can comment a little bit about it. And again, I think non-medical management or you know, the surgical approach to you know, fish size and Crohn's disease could be a topic of discussion in its own. But I can comment a little briefly on it. Yeah, and just, I think, just briefly. Yeah. And then um, we've got some questions to go over too. So let's yeah. uh, just briefly sure. give a so summary. Yeah, so you know, symptomatic, simple fistulas. You can treat them with cetons or even doing like a little fistulotomy, taking care of that right then and there. Um, complex fistulas, and again, this is going back to how we defined them a little earlier, classified them a little earlier. Again, cetone placements probably need a combination of medical therapy because these are a bit more complex depending on where they are, whether they're with or without an abscess. And again, the timing of that cetone removal really depends on subsequent therapy, the drainage of that abscess. This is where imaging comes into play if you want to follow these patients you know, with serial endoscopic ultrasound or serial MRIs. You can help use those to time the removal of these cetones. Typically, if there's you know not a lot of uh, mucosal involvement in the rectum, uh, these patients probably will respond well to just you know antibiotics and fistulotomies and you know pretty simple flap surgeries. If there is a lot of involvement in the rectum uh, of the mucosa, then you know you're more than likely thinking they're going to end up needing some form of immunological or immunosuppressive therapy. But they're still going to benefit from a CTOM placement as well. Um, complex fistulas, it's a combination probably of surgery with some of the medications we just talked about. So any fistula with like an abscess or complex fistula should be drained. So that's where our surgeons, um, you know, having good close relationships with them comes into play. Cetons are probably going to be used, um, probably put those in before we start one of these medications. Sometimes you need a proximal diversion. So you want to let that rectal or perianal area heal um, in some of these refractory cases. And in very some you know severe clinical scenarios, we've gone through a series of medications, cetone placements, fistulotomies, abscess drainage, etc. Um, sometimes a procto- proctectomy or even a total proctocolectomy with a permanent stoma may be necessary. Um, sounds scary, but you know that's that's why we kind of honed in on the beginning of controlling, really controlling this inflammation and getting it, um, you know, in, in remission. And but unfortunately, sometimes in very severe scenarios, uh, a diversion may be needed. So let, let me make a couple comments about that. So number one, about ceton removal, it's a very common question the patients have. When can I remove this? And oftentimes I leave it to the surgeon. But if you look at, I mean, there's no clear guidelines on this. The one guideline I could find was the ECHO guidelines, which uh, pretty much said that, um, you know, after induction therapy, um, 
like so if you were going to use Remicade, for example, after you get the week zero to six, so after six weeks of therapy, and also with the resolution of the inflammation in the rectum, then you can try taking it out. Um, some data suggests that there's a high recurrence rate if you take it out too early, but also if you leave it in too long, it may it may prevent healing of fistulas too. The data is kind of all over the place, but I think that is reasonable. You know, patients don't want these cetons in forever. Um, you don't want this like loop of whatever a rubber band or plastic within your rectum forever. You know, it's hard to clean and things like that. So. Um, I think it is reasonable to give it a shot. Although I've seen some colorectal surgeons just say like, oh, if it's in, if it's tol- if you're tolerating it okay, just keep it in. Um, and sometimes it just falls off on its own and then they don't put another one in and just see how things go. So there really isn't a real consensus as far as when to take it out. As far as diversion is concerned, um, yeah, I mean, when you divert the fecal, sp- fecal stream, meaning you take, instead of the stool going through that rectal area with all the fistulas, um, you, you create a diversion, so you have a colostomy, stool coming out into a bag, and then you pretty much, you know, you, you may do a loop colostomy, or um, that tends to be what is the case. Uh, that When you have less stool going through the rectum with the diversion, most of the time, things heal up, you know, I would say over 60% of the time. Uh, I did have a patient recently who it did not work. She continued to have active fistulas, abscesses, despite being diverted, and end up, ended up getting that proctectomy and colectomy and an endoleostomy. Uh, the, the other thing is sometimes diversion is a temporizing measure. So, like, sometimes you'll divert somebody and then put them on medicine, hoping that the fistulas will improve, and then you reconnect them. That almost never works. That's, that's about a 17% um, likelihood of that actually working out. So it's still most people want to try that, but uh, and it's, if, if you really want to take a chance. But most of the time, it doesn't work out, and you still need surgery to remove everything. Right, right. Again, kind of uh, highlights how challenging this disease really is and how options are... Not as great. I mean, I think definitely the options today's age are way better than what we had decades ago, but it's still a you know, complex, challenging disease. Okay, so next let's talk about stem cell therapy. A lot of questions about that, um, and then I'll summarize and we'll go to questions. Sounds good. Yeah, so stem cells, so mesenchymal stem cells, this is kind of relatively a newer kid on the block, but also not really. So there's been a few studies that have come out over the past few years, almost up to a decade now. Um, and pretty much what you're doing is you're injecting these stem cells into the sites of where the fistulas are in hopes of inducing fistula healing um, in these patients. You kind of get these stem cells from like, you know, adipose tissue or fat or from the bone marrow Kind of the concept is a little bit similar to you know stem cell transplant in, in itself. Uh, you you can get this from yourself. You can get this from somebody matched, and essentially what it does is kind of down regulates the immune system in that area and helps again promote that tissue healing and repair. Um, and there's been some early phase one, two, three studies out there in patients with Crohn's and perineal fistulas. And it's actually some decent data out there. I mean, there's it's it's efficacy, it's safety, it works. Uh, the patient populations in these studies are kind of, again, variable. One had like 12 patients, one had like 20 patients, one had 100 patients. And one in particular, you know, there, there was a phase three clinical trial done. They used allogenic adipose tissue derived stem cells from the fat. And so 51% of these patients out of 103 who were treated with these stem cells had a clinical remission compared to 34% of patients who didn't, who received placebo. And recently, just a couple of years ago, there was a, you know, they looked at the long-term efficacy and safety of stem cell therapy for complex perineal fistulas. This is in 2018 called the Admire CD study. And pretty much what they did was, you know, there's, there's not a lot of existing therapies out there that are durable, and we kind of know that and touched upon it. So they wanted to see what is the long-term healing results of doing these stem cell uh, therapy. Um, and pretty much what they found was that, you know, uh, in the in this phase three trial, that there the patients who had 
Crohn's disease. They were treatment refractory. They found that it was really safe and effective in closing the external openings compared to placebo after about a year. So there's a greater proportion of patients who achieved that remission versus the control. They had improvement in their symptoms and complete healing too. Um, they looked at other things in this study too. I mean, they, they, they monitored them with MRIs. They did clinical examinations. They made sure there was an absence of the draining and things like that. Um, but, you know, th this was a phase three double blind study done that came out of Europe and Israel, and it, and it does show some promise. Yeah, in, in my brief review of the of mesenchymal stem cells, I've been pretty impressed with the results. Um, I do think this is really promising, and hopefully we can get, you know, definitive trials to get this on the market. Um, you know, the few things I got from it, you know, people may be worried about a cancer risk with using stem cells. So far, they have not seen any association of that with developing, like, new malignancies. The, this, the risk profile seems pretty good. I mean, only some patients develop some pain in the rectum or some abscesses related to the treatment, but that's probably related to the treatment itself to get the stem cells in rather than the stem cells themselves because they have to curatage the the uh, actual fistula tract, and then they also have to, most of these trials use like some sort of vehicle to get the stem cells in, like a, like a plug, or uh, most of the time it's like some sort of plug that they put in. Um, so it, it, yeah, it seems like a great, a great option. Unfortunately, a lot of the trials, they excluded patients who had proctitis, inflammation in the rectum, uh, and it was only patients who had just known Crohn's disease with no proctitis, just with the fistulas. So it remains to be seen if it would actually help fistulizing disease when there's actual rectal inflammation in, as well, because then you may need biologics along with it. And maybe it's a combination therapy that most people need. Um, and also stem cells, I'd be curious to see how that affects even non-fistulizing Crohn's disease, maybe just injecting that into the bowel and seeing how that works. But I don't think anyone's studying that yet. Yeah, no, that's definitely an interesting thought um, to see how that would help too. But yeah, I mean, I think it remains to be seen. I think, you know, I'm not sure if anyone in, in our community is doing this as of yet, um, but it will definitely be interesting to see if this comes out in the future. Okay, so let me just summarize, um, you know, uh, kind of how I conceptualize management of fistulas and then and then we'll go to the questions, okay? So, no, I mean, you should... The first thing you should do is determine the extent and severity of the Crohn's using scopes and imaging, and then you need to characterize the fistula tracts, right? And we talked about how that can be done with the combination of an uh, exam under anesthesia, maybe um, ultrasound versus MRI of the pelvis, and then you need to evaluate for abscesses, make sure you address that if they need to be drained by a radiologist or addressed by the surgeon. Um, and then, the, and you always have to do that before going to the medical therapy. And sometimes, that, most of the time, that requires cetons as well. And then, if you have fistulas that are proximal to strictures uh, that are causing a partial obstruction, those are probably going to require surgery and are probably not going to respond to medical therapy. And fistulas that cause few or low grade symptoms and not associated with an abscess or a stricture. They may be able to just be treated with medical therapy alone, and here we're talking mostly about internal fistulas rather than the perianal form. Um, yeah, so that's my summary. Anything you want to summarize as well as far as what you took away from looking all this information up? Uh, no, I mean, I think you kind of you pretty much nailed it right there, and I think, you know, when it comes to choosing the medications, if you can use infliximab or remicated flustral, that's probably, you know, the go-to after that, maybe try Humira or Adalimumab. And if not one of those two, then um, I think it, sometimes it can be a coin toss between Vitalizumab or Istikinumab and Tivir or Stellara. Uh, based off some of the studies we went over today, I'm almost inclined to try to use Intivio. Um, and if not, try to use Stellara. Okay. So questions. These were submitted through Facebook, Twitter, uh, mainly those two places. So in the future, if you guys want to ask your questions, Please also join the Facebook group, the private Facebook group. You can post them there as well. So how are fistulas best monitored? So um, from my perspective, there's no routine monitoring that's necessary. I think it's a good idea to see your colorectal surgeon, your GI on a regular basis. I do think this is particularly important 
if you notice some change in your symptoms, more severe rectal pain, if you feel like just things feel different, seeing more drainage, you should see some someone sooner rather than later. There is a rare complication of actually developing cancer like within these fistula tracts, like a squamous cancer um, that would be much better to detect earlier rather than later. Um, so any, any data or anything you found about routine monitoring of these fistulas or is that kind of up in the air? Yeah, it's kind of up in the air. And I mean, I would agree with you. So, I mean, the way we pretty much diagnose is just by, you know, taking the history from the patient and doing your physical exam. And so I think the best way to monitor this is having the patient keeping an eye on their own symptoms. As soon as they feel like something's not going right or something feels off, you know, come right in and tell us about it. But otherwise, I think the routine visits that we normally have with our inflammatory bowel disease patients is what, what I would probably keep to. And if you have perianal disease that's active, that's changing, don't do a virtual appointment. You know, you need, yeah. somebody needs to see you in person. So is there a difference in the management of inflammatory versus fibrotic fistula tracts? From my perspective, I don't really think of them in that way. There probably is a, co like a combination of both, but... Um, you know, some people talk about fistula tracts getting epithelialized, meaning it develops like a true um, lining that's similar to the bowel. And those tend to be somewhat resistant to medical therapy. But I don't think the management is different. I mean, if you have a fistula, you have a fistula, and the medical management is similar. Right, I would agree. I think I characterize strictures more as inflammatory or fibrotic, but I think when it comes to uh, fistulas being inflammatory or fibrotic, the approach is probably going to be the same. Right. Um, how prevalent is injected stem cell therapy in the management of fistulas in the U.S.? So it's not prevalent. Uh, it's definitely not used in our center, but we're, we're not an academic center. We, we're more in a hybrid teaching type community hospital right now. But uh, it's not usually done. I mean, it's not FDA approved yet because they don't have the sufficient research done um, to approve it and to know what dose is necessary, what's the best way to administer it. So if you want to get this done, I actually posted a link in my Facebook group where Mayo Clinic has an ongoing trial, uh, both at their Scottsdale and uh, Rochester locations. So it may not be realistic to get into those trials if you don't live in those areas. But those are the two sites that I know of. But uh, good luck finding this at your local colorectal surgeon's clinic. It's probably not going to happen. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think some of these studies are still fairly new. Phase three, uh, I'm sure there's phase four going on, but hopefully in the future. Yeah, I know there are these places like outside the U.S. in like Panama and Costa Rica that like do stem cell therapy in quotes uh, and usually they administer it through the IV but that's completely off the grid type of stuff <laughs> so <All right. laughs> um, I am not recommending or endorsing that kind of stuff I don't even know if they would do rectal administration probably not but that's the only thing I know of um, so let's see is there any evidence that hyperbaric chambers meaning hyperbaric oxygen therapy could assist with fistulas, either healing or preventative, or is that all still speculative? Um, you know, I did a podcast on hyperbaric oxygen therapy, all about that, so just listen to that. But the short answer is, number one, the data is pretty sparse. Yeah, there is some low-quality evidence that it can be effective, especially as, like, adjunctive therapy to, like, other methods we discussed. But the problem is insurance pretty much never covers it. In my experience, I've tried a few times and have not had any success. And also, it's, it's hard to find places. Uh, there, there are private facilities that do it that charge a lot of money and usually need repeated treatments. So it's not financially feasible for most people. And um, yeah, and insurance doesn't cover it. So it's still not something I usually use at this point. Right. I think, you know, I've seen it been done in, a, you know, a hospitalized patients where, we're, like you referred to this before, we're kind of throwing the kitchen sink at them just to get them feeling better, just to see some response, kind of almost like a last-ditch effort based off, you know, their wishes for it to be used. And I think there is some rule for it. I think it may help, you know, with the fistula drainage, 
Um, if anything, it may make, you know, some of these objective data that we look at, like CRPs and fecal cows, things like that, maybe those numbers get better, but I'm not really sure how much it really helps the patient. Yeah, I've seen the pediatric GIs have more success getting approval for it for some reason. Um, but on the adult side, I've never, never had any success. I always right. bring it up on rounds. I think I've been on rounds with you yeah. in the past and said, oh, let's talk to pulmonology. They're usually the ones in charge of the hyperbaric oxygen. And eventually I got an email saying it's, it's, it's never, <laughs> never approved, yeah. so stop asking. Yeah. Um, so are there things that can be done preventively to avoid re-emerging fistulas or new ones? I mean, if you're going to go by the data, it's just staying on your medication if it works. Uh, if you really want to go by the research, are there things you can do with your diet? Do I believe in my hard diet makes a difference with respect to fistulas and maybe preventing recurrence? I believe that, but I don't have any evidence to suggest the, the only evidence I came across with regard to diet and fistulizing disease were some, was a case series using exclusive enteral nutrition, which at least in some cases showed closure of both enterocutaneous and perianal fistulas. So, um, I mean, that's something that has no side effects that we know of. It's hard to do, but for the very motivated patient, perhaps for a, to a, for a bridge to something else, maybe like something like Intibio or Stellara, something with a better side effect profile, it is something to consider. But again, very weak data. That's like the bottom of the pyramid case reports. Anecdotal doesn't really mean much. Right. Um, so, can fistulas manifest through an ileostomy stoma? Asad, did you see any uh, reports of that in your review? Um, based off what I can recall, nothing that comes off the top of my mind with like very strong data. Um, so I think maybe peristomal, but not. And I'm not sure if that's what they're referring to. Yeah, I think that's what they mean. Like a like an il, a, a fistula coming from the neoterminal ilium around the stoma somewhere. So it, it can happen. Uh, yeah. And it's usually in the context of somebody who's had like ulcerative colitis. And then after colectomy, they have an endoleostomy. And if, if it's, if it happens relatively quickly after surgery, like if within three to seven days, it's most likely due to surgical issues with injury to the neoterminal ilium for some reason, um, either is it related to how they were, how the ostomy was created or ischemia or something like that. And that usually needs a surgical revision. But if it's been like more than three months since the surgery, it's it may be from Crohn's involving that terminal ileum. And you can try medical therapy. And if that doesn't work, you need to do surgery. So it's very uncommon, but possible. Mm -hmm. Um, can internal fistulas around the small bowel be discussed? Uh, what research supports a more natural approach? Well, we discussed small bowel internal fistulas, and we talked about that already. The, there's no research that supports a natural approach. I wish there was, but hopefully in the future we'll get some treatments. Mm. Um, does diet have an impact? We don't know. We talked about exclusive mineral nutrition. What about supplements? Nope, I'm not aware of any supplements that make any difference here. Is there a way to heal without suppressing the immune system? We talked about exclusive animal nutrition, hyperbaric oxygen, antibiotics. But again, in the setting of Crohn's, you probably are going to need some immunosuppression. Um, and then they talked, somebody asked about vagus nerve stimulation research. Yeah, there's some preliminary data, very low quality evidence that vagus nerve stimulation can help with Crohn's, but not specifically when it comes to fistulas from my brief review of the literature uh and then yeah that's pretty much it i got some other questions but they weren't relevant to the topic um so there we go there's our review about fistulas sorry i know it's a difficult if you're dealing with this right now um it's probably one of the toughest manifestations of crohn's to deal with so i i i hear you and um Hopefully we have better better options. I'm really hopeful for mesenchymal stem cells. I think I'm, I really hope that comes out soon because I think that's great because realistically the biologics, although they work long term, you know, don't seem to work out for most people, unfortunately. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I hope 
you know, I think in today's day and age with the way technology and science and everything is going, I think there's definitely a place for that in the future, hopefully very near future. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Asad, for joining right. us today. Yeah, no, thanks for Thanks for having me. And hopefully the listeners didn't go to sleep. Um, and and uh, hopefully it was worthwhile for you. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs>